So we've now got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, and if people could say their name and their institutional affiliation, okay? And also keep your questions short. Presidential elections or <laughs> I mean I, th I don't foresee that the relationships with ASEAN would be particularly affected by a Jokowi presidency. I don't think that would change um, the relationship. I mean, one of the things that Jokowi has said is, of course, I don't speak English, and people have said I don't have a foreign policy or an economic policy. And so, in terms of the commenta uh, in terms of the running mate of Jokowi, I think that that's um, it's certainly something that the three things that they're looking for is somebody who can actually balance out some of his shortcomings in terms of foreign policies, a much clearer economic policy. I don't think we're seeing much of that that's come out of the the Jokowi camp, as well as his, his ability to conduct some of these um, international relationships. But I mean, I don't necessarily foresee um, changes to the way that, that uh, the relationships are carried out at the moment. I mean, it'd be interesting to see how the relationship pans out with Australia in terms of um, a lot of the issues with asylum seeker uh, cooperation and so on that's at the moment um, quite tense relationship between Indonesia and Australia. Um, but I think that we've got a long way to go before we get to, to that point where we see what does the campaign look like and um, wh who will be running with, with Jokowi um, to lead Indonesia in the next period. I don't know. Yeah. Colleagues may have other things to add. Okay. Another question. Yes, you've got an, another question. Yes. Um, now we've actually we're getting a roving microphone so that poor Dave can hear. Hello, Dave. Um, luckily, I have a loud voice, so I don't need a microphone. But if someone would like to indicate, yes, just here in the front. Hi, my name is Chris Frizing. I'm a PhD student here at Melbourne Uni. And um, this question, oh, first of all, thanks to all the panel panelists for their presentations. Um, and this question um, kind of a, is a general one, uh, perhaps based on their talks, most directed towards Dirk and to Dave. But um, I was wondering, putting on your sort of prognostication caps, uh, looking sort of down the line, if you see any um, potential coalescence uh, or, or sort of a, a change in sort of the fragmented nature, at, at least from a party perspective of the, um, uh, the electoral system. Um, and sort of related to that, if you see uh, sort of the uh, personality-driven politics of the, certainly of the presidential race, talking about the Jacobi effect and things like that, um, if you see that continuing, at least, say, you know, for the foreseeable future, um, say, you know, the next pre presidential cycle, whether you imagine it would still be sort of a personality-driven uh, contest uh, in the way that it sounds like um, we're dealing with now. Dave, do you want to add uh, why don't you go first, and then uh, you've got something going on. I'm going to <laughs> <laughs> so you just talk sort of roughly around there. Okay. Um, I start maybe with the last bit that you pointed out. In 2019, someone mentioned it. In 2019, the electoral system will change to the extent that parliamentary and presidential elections will be held simultaneously. So that will probably have an impact, effect on how the campaign is run, because parties will have to nominate their candidates way before, basically. So that will have an impact. Um, for this year alone, the presidential election is a completely different kettle of fish. There, the Jacobi effect, I think, will be on display. Um, that I've basically endorsed what, what Dave was saying. I think he will still win. Um, but because the result was now not as good as he was hoping, or as PDIP was hoping for, um, there may be the need for slightly more, you know, more backroom deals than he was hoping for. But still, he would still look at the polls. He's still a leading candidate. And he will still dominate the talks that he will have about potential coalitions. Would you 
agree with that? Apple. <laughs> 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 That's great. Yeah, sure. I, yeah, the, uh, I guess I'll go to the difference in five years, uh, and I'd certainly agree with what Dirk said there about, you know, we, we don't even know how the nomination of presidents is going to work now that the constitutional court has ruled that the presidential and, uh, and legislative elections have to be simultaneous. Uh, but this time, because you had Udiono coming to the end of his 10 year term without having nominated a, a, or come up with a viable successor, uh, it, it hasn't really been a presidential election or when we get to the presidential election based on track record. Uh, and so, you know, you, you've had great disillusionment with politics uh, and someone sort of considered a new style of leader coming through and capturing that as, as political capital to search the front runner. But in five years' time, you you will have an incumbent, and, and so part of the race is going to be about their record. Uh, and so if, if it is Tripoli, presumably uh, personality is not going to be enough. Uh, people, people are going to look at uh, what has he done as president uh, over the past five years. Um, as to whether the parliament remains more fragmented, uh, well, if people are right that it's individual campaigning that's pushing the fragmentation, then I guess there's every chance. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, sort of, some people have predicted ahead of this election that you'd actually see something of a consolidation. Uh, so I, I think we're going to have to wait till we get more detailed uh, uh, sort of exit poll data, uh, other kind of survey research trying to begin to why people voted the way they did this time. And then with that, uh, we, can, we can look ahead to uh, what parties might be able to succeed in five years' time. Thank you. Yes? I've got a pretty loud voice. No, but still might as well. Okay. You're a bit further away than from Dave. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, thank you again as well uh, for your presentations. Uh, my question is to Vanessa. I worked on the uh, election last year in Kenya uh, where we had uh, the presidential and the vice presidential candidates um, who were eventually elected, uh, both indicted at the International Criminal Court for human rights um, alleged human rights abuses. The, the, main, the, the interesting element of it was that um, this was in fact used as a political ploy um, to drum up nationalistic support against what was perceived as Western uh, standards, I guess. Um, and um, this was used incredibly successfully, so much so that they, I mean, there were other factors why they were elected, but this was a, a major thing that was used. Um, and so much so that the, the main opposition a leader was, was painted as a, a puppet of the West because he supported the International Criminal Court. O obviously, there's no ICC implications in, in, in Indonesia, but I'm interested how, if this kind of narrative is coming to it around nationalism and human rights in what you're seeing as a, a bit of a, a trend towards these parties that were implicated in human rights. My name's Blaise Murphy, I'm from Swinburne University. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I mean, it is, Early on in the transition post Sahata, there were there, there were demands about how to you know one of the ways to uh, enforce human rights accountability would be through uh, tribunal mechanisms. Indonesia tried to set up a truth and reconciliation tribunal and so on. There's a long history to do with that, and these things never eventuated. So the spectre of an international human rights tribunal, I think, is certainly very much out of the picture now, including on the question of Timor Leste. And so I think there isn't that threat, but at the same time, as you say, there's a, the issue of resource nationalism has been a, a very big one in the country, and I think that the, some of the appeal around Garindra has been around the question of mining and resources and greater royalties to Indonesia and, and those kinds of, of issues. But I'm not sure to what extent that nationalism is driving hum the issue of not wanting to account for human rights uh, so much now, but it's more a question that uh, the ruling elites still, um, the people who are associated with the ruling elite of the past are still in, in very influential um, positions today. So that, that's the reason why these um, uh, efforts are stalling um, at, at this point in time. And, yeah, and I think to an extent the resource nationalism is, is a bit of an outlier, that it's not really in keeping with the trend towards liberalisation and globalisation that the Indonesian economy has been, um, you know, has been on for quite some time. So that's why the issue of resource nationalism is really raising the ire of a lot of foreign investors at the moment. And it is, um, 
it is hitting a nerve in terms of people seeing that as something legitimate. And perhaps it is a question of, again, this reprioritisation of, of rights, you know, recasting what is meant by human rights. Does it in, involve rights to your um, resources? And, and these sorts of questions. But I'm not convinced that, um, that nationalism and rights is driving the sort of sweeping um, Prabowo's human rights record under the carpet, necessarily. Thank you. Now, we've got time for probably one more question. Two more, the boss says. Yes? And don't forget name and affiliation. Um, Nicholas Rees from Election Watch. Um, I actually listened with great interest to descriptions of the underwhelming result for PDIP. Dirk, I think you put that forward, and Thomas, you did as well, and Dave, you did as well. Uh, I mean, they still had a 5% swing to them, which in a 12-party system's a pretty good result. I mean, not as good as Gorinda, which had sort of 7.5%, but still 5% is a very solid swing. Um, and maybe this was a case of um, the results not living up to expectations. So people's expectations have been set very high. That, in turn, could have been a result of polling, um, if PDIP attracts most of its support amongst sort of middle class urban voters, Gorinda gets most of its support from rural voters, you would tend to see in a polling system that um, you would see over-representation of urban voters, that would tend to over-represent PDIP in, their, in the polling. So that sets up this ex expectation that they're going to do very well. Then when they don't, the whole result gets portrayed as this sort of you know, really underwhelming, disappointing result for PDIP. You strip all that out and so that's very good result for Petty IP and probably means that, that, that uh, uh, Jocko is on track to solidly be elected president later this year. Anyway, I just wanted to test, see people's views on that sort of slightly contrarian view to what's been put so far tonight. Yeah, I, I realised that as I was talking, that's why on my last slide I tried to reinforce the point that it was actually, we have a change in the biggest party in parliament and it was actually a, vi a victory for PDP. We should not forget that, so I agree. Um, I think part of the point is that Jokowi was sort of equated with PDIP to a large extent and if you travel around the country way before the election, um, across the board, people would say that Jokowi is their favorite candidate, and because he was affiliated with PDIP, the assumption was that if they actually make it clear that they're going to run him as presidential candidate, that would boost their result further. And yeah, so it was reflected in the polls. Some polls had PDIP um, with Jokowi by way over 30%. And of course, if you read that, you get to that expectation. And the party itself was putting forward an official aim of 27%. Um, we've seen that in the past in Indonesia many, many times that parties have very unrealistic aims. Even those very minor parties would regularly say they want 10, 15 percent or so. Um, but I think in this case it seemed actually realistic. And when they didn't get it, that's why I think it was so underwhelming. A victory, yes, but um, yeah, because the expectation was so high, it was a bit of an anticlimax. That's why. Could I add in a little question to that? Is part of the difference because of whether they're going singly, which was the hope? Or in a coalition, just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, people were hoping yes. that if they get a higher vote share, that all this horse trading about vice presidential candidate cabinet posts would not happen. So a higher vote would have had much further implications about what happens after this election. Now, with that result, now they may still sneak in eventually that they may get twenty percent of the seats, mm -hmm. and if that happens, I think then that would give them you know more autonomy in deciding what to do. But yeah, clear, uh, clearly the, the broad implication was that we could see a change to the style of politics if the result of the parliamentary election is resounding and overwhelming. And it wasn't, and so people are so, uh, okay, so now it's going to go to Gorka and whatever, and you know, so the same old thing. So. so if I could say something on that, there's usually a buck for the big parties on their actual vote by the number of seats they're going to get in the so they're very close to 20% and they might end up with well over 20 they could end up with previous elections with 23% and then they clearly have the numbers without the coalition to come up to Okay, we can have one no, last... Can just oh, say something okay. there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I think the interesting thing on the result is that 
if PDIB had simply lived up to what the polls were saying and got kind of low to mid-20s, then yeah, I don't think there's much difference in terms of practical outcomes. Uh, I mean, uh, they may not quite meet the nomination threshold for president, but they have the most suitable candidate. And so a party like Mustang presumably can't make many demands on them uh, to join in and get them over the line. Um, it, it was more the party itself had death had the dream much higher. Uh, Jacob, Koi, when he's gone around campaigning, uh, uh, had talked about having a, uh, a, uh, a victory by the white margin uh, so that they wouldn't need to enter into bargain. And, uh, you wouldn't have the situation of Jakarta where it has small parliamentary support. Uh, so I think uh, uh, where there's been an idea that this wasn't uh, an emphatic victory, it comes from that. But the, 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 the plurality is not large enough. Uh, that uh, that it changed the equation for them in terms of the political bargaining uh, that they would need to do in the pub parliament. Although, as I said, I think there's still an alternative to two uh, in terms of, of using uh, his great cachet with the public uh, to try to push through negotiations uh, on, on contentious bills rather than going for, for an ineffective large coalition. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a plurality. Uh, it's only 2% votes wise below what Democrat got five years ago. Um, so, so sure, uh, it's, it's still a victory for PDRP, just not the victory that they themselves have dared to dream of. My name is Ali. I'm uh, studying at the University of Melbourne, Sydney. The um, question is, um, given that um, Greenra, uh, Hanura, uh, and then Nasdem, uh, and then Goa Kartu Sabrigri, um, gained um, quite significant votes if you combine them together you get about a third of the votes is that a reflection of Indonesian missing Suharto or having a Suharto's ghost coming back to haunt us There, there is a campaign to bring Suharto back into campaigning, into you know wondering if the p previous period was better. So, and I, I do think that there is such a campaign that exists. That there is a, you know, the nostalgia is real, is what I'm saying. It doesn't just exist on your Facebook feeds and so on. It, it there, there is actually a, you know, the, there are books and websites and uh, all sorts of things that are set up for people to think back to the period before as something that was much better than, than what it is, despite all of Golkar's um, desire to disassociate itself from its uh, new order past, I think that it is now, there is very much a battle to remember and how to remember the new order regime and the, the Sahara period. So, and I think that you know, a lot of people who are concerned about this issue now are, are thinking about this um, battle over memories, about how to remember the Suharto period and what kinds of issues do we need to raise to say to people, he, might, he may have brought development, but there are all these other issues that came with it that people have to think about. And I do think we're dealing with a, a whole new generation of people, of, of young people who've come to the fore and who are wondering what are the solutions for the Indonesian nation to, to, to deal with what they, many people de uh, call the multi-dimensional crisis. So, and I, I don't rule out the, the bringing back the rehabilitation of Suharto in, into the picture. Um, can I jump in as well and just say, uh, I think the more fundamental issue is dissatisfaction. Uh, I mean, people unhappy with their economic position, unhappy with the fact that they feel they're not better off now than what they were perhaps five years ago. Uh, and then it's a, it's a way of how parties can try to frame that. Uh, I mean, it was a recurring theme in these large party rallies that Indonesia is rich in natural resources, uh, but look at the state of the nation and you know, we're basically uh, will be the most effective party uh, to uh, create greater prosperity. Uh, and so, yeah, you can, you can put the focus on yourself, the party, uh, uh, or in some cases, uh, people have turned to the soldier. Uh, for instance, you have Sahado family members 
uh, from memory of Kiri McKilcarter's final rally in Surabaya. But when it has been Sa'ato family members who've tried to, uh, to capitalise on, on any nostalgia, they just haven't done well electorally. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced it's the fact that Prabowo is Sahar's former son-in-law uh, so much as, uh, as is he met as a firm leader who's saying he can make an Indonesian Asian tiger uh, that, uh, that, that can contribute so quite a bit of his popularity. Now, as you know, this uh, event was run by both the Election Regulation Research Network and the Centre for Indonesian Law, Islam and Society. So it's on behalf of both of those organisations that I'd like to say a few things. Uh, the first is to Election Watch and the School of Government for their involvement and to Professor Simon Evans, uh, Pro Vice-Chancellor International at the University of Melbourne for his support. Uh, to Tony Choi from C Productions uh, for filming the talks uh, and to our speakers. Uh, and we have a little token, but unfortunately to you, Dave. <laughs> I just have to say, some things just <laughs> So we'd like to thank the Conquistas, just a small token of our gratitude. Thomas Reuter, thank you very much. And to Vanessa, thank you. And once again, thank you. And we'd like to express our thanks to you. Now, I'd also like to thank uh, Jean Go from uh, the Election Regulation Research Network, uh, as well as Catherine Taylor and Vicky Eichmann from SILIS, uh, the Centre for Indonesian Law, Islam and Society, who assisted it with organising uh, the seminar tonight. But particular thanks, and some of you just... No, this is me, we have to this. <laughs> uh, particular thanks go to Tessa Shaw, uh, from the Centre for Indonesian Law, Islam and Society, because she was the key organiser for this event. Thank you. So that concludes tonight. Uh, thank you to everybody, and thank you also to the audience for attending and your attendance.